have Tara Han present. She's going to be talking about posterior uveitis with some of the kind of newer immunologic treatments. So. It's actually Tara Han. Thanks, Reese. Um, I'm going to be presenting a neuroophthalmology case as well. So, so that's, that, that's that southern, you know, there's that southern shade. <laughs> <laughs> <that you're laughs> I think it's intentional. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a 52-year-old male who presents to the neuro-ophthalmology clinic complaining of a gray cloud off-center in his right eye. Um, he's noticed this for the past three weeks, and he's not had any symptoms in his left eye. Um, on review of systems, he endorses a swimming feeling in his head and says that he feels off balance. He's also noticed that food tastes different, and he's lost about 25 pounds in the past month. He has a mild headache in the morning, which is new. He's not had that in the past, and he uh, denies any uh, tinnitus or pulse synchronous tinnitus. Past ocular history is um, just remarkable for a remote history of a corneal foreign body in his left eye. And his past neurologic history is unremarkable. He um, has no history of migraines. Interestingly, he was diagnosed with metastatic melanoma about nine months ago and uh, developed hypothyroidism from his immunotherapy uh, and was started on levothyroxine about four weeks ago. Um, his medications, in the past he was on a combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab for 12 weeks, and now he's on nivolumab only, and that was for the treatment of his melanoma. Um, and he's also on amlodipine, rosuvastatin, trazodone, and levothyroxine. His social history is unremarkable. On exam, his vision in the right eye was uh, 2030. His pressure was normal. He had a 0.3 log unit APD on the right. His color uh, vision testing was normal, but he did have a mild amount of red desaturation on the right. His critical flicker fusion was asymmetrically decreased on the right. His extraocular motility was full, but he uh, fell off target with left head thrust and had psychotic eye movements with head rotation to the left. And his uh, anterior chamber slit lamp exam was uh, within normal limits besides some corneal irregularity on the left. These were his fields. Um, you can see on both eyes he has enlarged blind spots. On the right he has a superior and inferior arcuate, and on the left he has an inferior arcuate. On dilated exam he had three plus optic nerve edema on the right side. He had half plus cell, um, no haze, and a blunted foveal light reflex. He had some venous tortuosity and a normal periphery. In the left eye, he had one plus optic nerve edema, uh, no cell and no flare. His macula was normal. His uh, veins on, or his vessels on the side were also tortuous, and his uh, periphery was normal. Um, on OCT, the top is the right and the bottom is the left. Um, he had some uh, subretinal fluid underneath the fovea, and his left was normal. And then on FA, he had uh, diffuse leakage of the optic nerves uh, late in both eyes. This is the right and the left. So his uh, differential that we considered, um, first, uh, CNS metastatic disease. He is being treated for metastatic melanoma, has these new headaches um, and CNS symptoms. Um, we also considered VKH, increased intracranial pressure, CNS lymphoma, CSCR, neuroretinitis, syphilis, sarcoid, and drug-induced GBitis. Um, so upon further questioning, he also endorsed a history of some hearing loss, which was recent, and then also said that he had had some whitening of his eyebrows, which was new. Whoops. You kind of see it here. And then he also endorsed some hypopigmented areas along his jawline, which were also new. His workup included RPR, FTA, Quantifurin Gold, ACE, Lysozyme, B12, and Folate, and those were all um, within normal limits. He had a lumbar puncture, um, which was remarkable for a pleocytosis, but was otherwise normal, including cytology, which didn't show any malignant cells. He had an MRI brain, which was normal, uh, didn't show any evidence of metastasis. 
<coughs> and uh, prior to presentation, he had already been started on a course of oral prednisone by the referring provider, so that was continued. Um, we considered treating him with an Ozerdex in his right eye for the subretinal fluid, but that resolved within two weeks, so he didn't end up needing that. So his presentation was consistent with uh, VKH syndrome, which is uh, bilateral granulomatous panuveitis and serous retinal detachments. Um, the criteria for diagnosis include um, that there can't be any history of ocular trauma or surgery because histopathologically this is identical to sympathetic ophthalmia. And then three of the following four have to be met, bilateral chronic iridocyclitis, posterior uveitis with any of the following multifocal exudative retinal or RPE detachments, dyskyperemia or edema, sunset glow fundus, which is a yellow-orange appearance of the fundus due to depigmentation of the choroid or the RPE, and neurologic signs such as tinnitus, meningismus, vertigo, hearing loss, cranial nerve symptoms, or CSF pleocytosis, and any cutaneous findings such as alopecia, poliosis, or vitiligo. So then the other question is, is this in any way related to his cancer? There have been several reports of VKH-like syn syndromes in patients treated with these immune checkpoint inhibitors like he was on. There's one case in the dermatology literature of a 55-year-old on nivolumab, um, was found to be actually HLA-DR4 positive and um, treated with topical steroids with resolution. And another case of um, a 54-year-old with melanoma on ipilimumab who was uh, observed and um, their symptoms resolved. In these cases, the onset of uveitis um, can be immediate or delayed. And in the phase three clinical trial data of ipilimumab, ophthalmic inflammatory conditions such as uveitis, episcleritis, and scleritis occurred in less than 1% of patients. Um, so to contrast the first case, this is another case that presented to the uveitis clinic. Um, this was a, um, and she also had a VKH-like picture after starting an immune checkpoint inhibitor. She was a 78-year-old female with metastatic melanoma who developed hearing loss, rash, vision loss within two weeks of starting pembrolizumab. <coughs> she had ciliary body detachment and choroidal effusions and panuveitis. The hearing loss and the rash resolved with systemic steroids, but her vision loss continued uh, to deteriorate, and she developed um, bilateral retinal detachment despite repeat <coughs> subtenons kinolog injections. She underwent a complex retinal detachment repair with retisert placement, and her final vision was count fingers in the right eye and 2050 in the left eye. <laughs> Um, so what exactly are these immune checkpoint inhibitors and how can they cause uveitis? Um, as you remember from immunology, T cell activation requires a co-stimulatory signal, which comes from the CD80, CD86 ligand interacting with the CD28 on the T cell. So here's the first signal and then this is the co-stimulatory signal. Um, CTLA4 is a CD28 homolog expressed on T cells that also interacts with CD80 and CD86 to cause an inhibitory signal of the T cell. Similarly, PD-1 is expressed on T cells and it um, results in energy of the T cell when it interacts with PD-L1. Tumors can hijack uh, these inhibitory pathways by expressing PD-L1 on their surface and allowing for tumor growth. In, in 2014, nivolumab was the first immune checkpoint inhibitor to be approved for the treatment of cancer, and it's now approved for metastatic melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, renal cell carcinoma, bladder cancer, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, and classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. In fact, these drugs have been so successful that there's now five uh, PD-1 axis um, immune checkpoint inhibitors that are approved for the treatment of cancer, and there's over 100 ongoing clinical trials for immune checkpoint inhibitors, so we'll mo most likely be seeing these drugs more often. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, with any drug that um, interacts in the immune system this way, there are some autoimmune uh, consequences. The most common of these are rash, colitis, hepatitis, endocrinopathies, and pneumonitis. Um, and because these are so common, they've developed consensus guidelines for the treatment of these. They're um, generally graded on uh, 
a scale of one to four based on the severity of symptoms. Uh, for grade one to two, generally treated with supportive care may involve holding the drug. Grade three to four involves holding the drug, treating with systemic steroids, and it may involve hospitalization. The majority of these events are reversible with a short course of steroids, and rarely other immunosuppressant agents such as infliximab are necessary. And PD-1 inhibitors, which are nivolumab and pembrolizumab, have a lower incidence of these events than the anti-CTLA-4 drug, ipilimumab. And then in our patient's case, he was treated with a, a combination therapy of nivolumab and ipilimumab, um, which was uh, approved for the treatment of metastatic melanoma because it showed improved survival compared to monotherapy. But as a, you can imagine, the immune-related adverse events of this combination therapy are uh, more severe, and they often uh, have a shorter time to onset. The ophthalmic manifestations of these drugs are um, less well characterized, and there aren't any consensus guidelines. Um, there's been kind of a variety of presentations described in the literature, so I'll go through some of them. Um, there's a case report of euthyroid ophthalmopathy induced by ipilimumab for melanoma, and that was successfully treated with IV steroids. There's been another case report also with ipilimumab of a bilateral uveitis and neuroretinitis with optic disc edema and macular edema, which was also successfully treated with steroids. And then there's been a case of an 81-year-old uh, male. He actually had a history of um, macular degeneration that was dry and uh, developed concurrent bilateral peripapillary CNBM and a unilateral subfovial CNBM that was thought to be related to his ipilimumab treatment, and he was treated with anti-VEGF and the cessation of the drug. And there's been one retrospective review where they looked at patients treated with ipilimumab who developed orbital inflammation and found that um, four of these were orbital inflammation, two were uveitis, one was peripheral ulcerative keratitis, and all were treated with systemic steroids. And this is a chart from that review article, which just kind of goes over some of the cases that I've uh, talked about and um, their treatments and whether they uh, resolved. So as you can see, most were treated with systemic corticosteroids, some got topical corticosteroids, most had resolution, and all but one, um, the drug had to be held. Um, so then the question is, if we're uh, holding the drug and giving these patients steroids, um, are we impacting their overall survival and decreasing the chance that um, their cancer is going to be treated? So there's been two studies in the oncology literature that addressed this question. Uh, one was a study on patients with ipilimumab that found that one-third of these patients did require systemic corticosteroids for some type of immune-related adverse, immune adverse event, um, but the immune adverse event or the need for steroids didn't impact their overall survival. And then there was a similar review of nivolumab, which showed that 24% received systemic immune modulating agents, and again, uh, that did not impact their overall response rate. So in summary, immune checkpoint inhibitors are becoming more prevalent. Ocular-related adverse events are rare, but they can include uveitis, orbital inf inflammation, CNBM, thyroid ophthalmopathy, and neuroretinitis. The majority of these manifestations resolve with steroids, and steroids do not impact overall survival. Any questions? So I submit that the uh, steroid survival question is still not totally answered. Uh, you start talking about subgroups and then subgroups, uh, and, and, and you talk about then about it not being statistically different is what we say that it didn't impact survival. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and my understanding is, is that, is that in general it looked like it wasn't as good, but it wasn't statistically different. So it may be a power issue as much as anything else, because you're, you're you're getting down a relatively small group. There's like a, I mean, I, I, and, and these things are amazing. I mean, people who routinely, it was a death sentence or survived. Right. And it looks like it's long-term survival. So absolutely, and the holy grail, when you talk to oncology, is this whole immunotherapy concept and idea. So we're just barely getting started on what's gonna happen. So I, I, I think that we have enough we can do comfortable doing that, but I don't think we can 
definitively know in need of if steroids don't impact survival. And of course, the other thing to remember is, is the whole concept now is, is not, we're there now, it's gonna be more and more and more. So the more we do, the more we're gonna expect other type of immunological results. And I, I thought that peripheral ulcerative keratitis, and that's a very bad disease as well. Yeah. I can see that starting to flare up. And so I think we as ophthalmologists are gonna start seeing a lot more of this. We need to be prepared. Um, I, I, I think we'll need to figure out better ways to start doing local therapy I mean, such things as steroid implants in the eye and stuff like that uh, as, we, as we get a better handle on exactly what's happening. Um, so actually they found that um, certain immune-related adverse events, so for example with melanoma, if you develop vitiligo, it's actually a positive uh, prognostic sign because, you know, it means that the drug is working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it means it's going after it's going after anything associated. With that. So in these studies, they actually found um, a trend towards actually people who were treated for their immune-related adverse events. It trended towards a better prognosis. Um, but that could possibly be because they were having a better response, not right. necessarily because of the steroid. Exactly. So, so so let's remember: the more the immune system seems to be revved up and going out of whack. Uh, John Zone used to always love before we had going with this to talk about he would have patients with end-stage metastatic melanoma in which they just said, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. And then all of a sudden, they would go through a violent, spontaneous immunological reaction. And these people were just awful and miserable. And the melanoma just disappeared. But 2% of patients, spontaneous, complete resolution. So he used to go on for a long time. He said, we figure out how to do this turn that immune system in, but I mean, I, I can still remember, said, Randy, it's just awful. I mean, they just, they just, they, they don't know what's going on, and all of a sudden, boom, every single melanoma the thing in the body, and they're cured. So, uh, it, we, we, we need to understand that, that this, the reason why they could be doing better is, is really the fact that their immune system has really been revved up, uh, not necessarily that, that, you know, that, that, that means that the steroid is treatment. So I just know that, that some people are, are looking at, really don't know exactly, but if you want the immune system to just go crazy, that maybe steroids are still not a good idea in spite of what we have, because we don't understand all of the causal issues. I think this is an underreported issue with these Um, and, you know, for a lot of the more common side effects, they, they do have a grading system. And so, like, for example, for rash, just any patient who gets a rash, they don't have the drug held and they're not given systemic steroids. They're given something topical. So I think, you know, 
and not phthalmic manifestation could be similar if it's mild and not vision threatening, but as in the case of the second patient, if it's, you know, they're gonna be cured of melanoma but be blind potentially, then it's kind of a different conversation. But um, with at least with everything else, they're, they've developed kind of a grading system. And in some cases, you know, the pneumonitis and hepatitis can, um, people die from that. So that's another thing to think about. Um, yeah, you'll have complications that you just simply have to treat. But, but I'm with Akbar. I think that, that to the extent we can treat it locally and not have to have systemic impact on what we're doing, that, uh, that's probably going to turn out over time to be smarter. And we've got this, this issue. If, if, you, if you really have bad complications, that means that you, you really are doing what you need to to try to get rid of the tumor, too. So they're responding better just because you're, you're, you're getting what you need. It's going to take time to figure all that out. But this is... This is just a start. I mean, they're, they're, this is the hot topic in oncology. Is a revving up the immune system to get rid of the cancer. So we're going to see a lot of this. Dr. Warner. The other uh, uh, resource for finding out about these kinds of problems, of course, there's published literature. But after a couple of case reports have been reported, that people will stop reporting single cases. But uh, at the FDA has mm -hmm. uh, very uh, robust database of adverse events for these medications, and you can find a lot about medications there. And then just uh, anybody who'd like a copy um, at the most recent Neurophology Society meeting uh, in April, uh, there was a uh, platform, uh, sorry, a, a teaching session on adverse effects of some of the newer cancer drugs, and these and all of their other friends uh, were highlighted because uh, there are a lot of ophthalmic and neuroophthalmic side effects of not just the checkpoint inhibitors, but some of the other fancy, fancy new medications, which you've never heard of, 